Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see so many uh, friends I haven't seen for a while. Um, so good to, to be here. Uh, so uh, Stefano Albertini, the director of the CASA, um, couldn't be here. So I'm, I'm going to be the host as well as part of the panel. Um, and so I'll, I'll introduce uh, the, the other speakers and Franco, the guest of honor, of course. Um, and then he'll talk uh, about his book a bit, and then we'll, uh, Professor Pugliese and I will come on stage and we'll uh, say some things about it and have a discussion, and then we'll have some questions from, from you. Um, so um, I'm Ruth ben Ghiad, I should have said that before, a professor of history and Italian studies here at NYU. And um, I, I'm, I'm super proud. Uh, I was the advisor of Franco's dissertation, um, which became this book. So I saw it develop and, um, over the years, and it's a very nice occasion for me personally, um, as well as professionally. So I'll introduce uh, Stan first. Uh, professor Stan Pugliese is professor of European history and the Queensboro Unico Distinguished Professor of Italian and Italian American Studies at Hofstra University. He's the author, editor, or translator of 15 books, including most recently, The Rutledge History of Italian Americans with William J. Connell. And he's currently writing a book uh, for Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux on um, Naples, scenes from the Siren City. And he's published so many interesting uh, things. Um, I use his anthology of fascism and anti-fascism a lot in class and um, did a superb piece on uh, graffiti of prisoners in, in, Ro in Rome, right? They were prisoners in Rome during World War II. Just a lot of very interesting research, important research he's done. So we're really happy to have you here. And Franco, uh, man of the hour, um, uh, Baldasso, assistant professor of Italian and director of the Italian program at Bard College. He's a fellow of the American Academy in Rome since uh, 2019 co-director of the Summer School, um, the Cultural Heritage and Memory of Totalitarianism at La Sapienza um, the University in Rome. And his work uh, focuses on the relations between fascism and modernism, the memory of political violence in Italy, and the idea of the Mediterranean in modern aesthetics. And he's had lots of um, research uh, support grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, uh, the Mellon Foundation, American Philosophical Society, uh, CIMA, the Center for Modern Italian Art, and, and others. Um, and we're here tonight to celebrate the, the publication of his book, Against Redemption, Democracy, Memory and Literature in Post-Fascist Italy, which came out um, last year with Fordham University Press. But he's also author of two books in Italian, Il Cerchio di Gesso, uh, Primo Levi, Narratore e Testimone, which is an amazing book um, on Primo Levi, and a book on uh, Malaparte, Curzio Malaparte, La letteratura crudele, um, which he published in 2019. And he's co-author of a book on uh, Whitman and Exile, which came out uh, with Mimesis in 2022. So without further ado, welcome uh, Professor Baldasso, who will speak about his book. Well, I'm not just uh, uh, excited and moved <laughs> to be here because uh, uh, this is a homecoming for me since, uh, as uh, Ruth has said, and I thank Ruth and Stan for being here tonight. Uh, I mean, uh, Casa Italiana represents so much for me because uh, that's where I, that's the, the, the first cultural institute, institute that I, that I, you know, learned to know in New York City. And uh, again, I was here as a PhD student. So this return with what I've been doing the last year, which is, this book after the PhD uh, means a lot. And I'm just glad to be among so many friends. So I'll, I'll just say some words about, about the book, um, you know, 
sketch out a, an introduction of what I did with this book and what I hope uh, can be compelling for a, for a further discussion. So, how Italy, how Italy's shared memory of fascism and its cultural heritage took shape remains the most disputed question in the nation's modern history, crossing the boundary between academic and public discourses. The legacy of fascism and World War II represent for Italians a contested battlefield of memory. The locus where national identity is negotiated, a history, as an anthropologist Michel Rolf Trouillot would say, in which key constituent parts are missing. My book Against Redemption concentrates on the years in which the struggle to establish a shared memory was at its highest. Those between the downfall of Mussolini in July 1943 and the victory of the Christian Democrats over the left in the 1948 general elections. Subject to political, ideological, and juridical controversy, the post-fascist transition in Italy was the period in which competing narratives over the recent, the recent national past took shape these narratives commanded the public discourse and justified the political agendas for decades to come. In recent years, Italy's transition to democracy has been the subject of increasing international debate, leading scholars to interpret it through the lens of a widespread repression of the fascist past. This paradigm, however, only partially reflects the transition's diverse intellectual and human scenario. And I have here some images of very prominent, famous uh, works from the fascist period. This is the EUR and the, the Palazzo della Civiltà Italiana. That, uh, and, uh, and less famous, but uh, as disturbing and uh, as uh, prominent from, uh, from many perspectives is uh, this other work that is uh, in the main hall of the Sapienza Università di Roma, which is the Italy Among the Arts and the Sciences, a fresco by Mario Sironi that uh, represents uh, a sort of victory of fascism uh, in the realm of knowledge, the different kind of sciences and arts, and uh, has been recently restored. It's a, a masterful piece of, of art, but also, uh, as you can see, there is no sign uh, when you enter the, the big hall of, of the Sapienza University uh, that signals the difficult heritage of this work. Also, the, the symbols that are clearly contrary like uh, Mussolini that are triumph and so on and so forth, to the values in which the, Republic, uh, the Italian Republic has been uh, built. So, uh, Against Redemption, my book, challenges this interpretation, the one of, the, of a repression of fascist past after uh, the end of fascism, by focusing on the ideological and cultural fluidity of early post-war Italy, in which pre-war world views were not completely discredited and new opposition were not clearly defined. The Italian case is, in fact, a unique case study for broader questions such as regime change and transition after democracy. And this is another picture from that time that re well represent the narratives of, of, um, of the resistance. In this scenario, in this scenario, early post literary practices became a primary means of communicating intellectual discontent. In my book, I question long-standing ideological tradition on confining the cultural production of early post-war Italy solely to the neo-realist discourse, thus underplaying neo-realism's disrupt disruptive political value. This is also the reason why my presentation today does not begin in one of the country's cultural capitals, but in the charming island of Capri. <laughs> and more specifically, <laughs> in one of the most celebrated modernist residences in Italy, the Casa Malaparte, which Jean-Luc Godard made famous with his film Contempt. I'm sure a lot of you have seen. In 1946, three of the many protagonists of my book, writers Elsa Morante, Alberto Moravia, and Curzio Malaparte, convened in Capri, exactly in this house, for a dinner. And here I have a picture of, a, of another party, another dinner, 1948, in which all three are present. Morav Moravia, Morante, and this is Malaparte. Why is this important? It is important because Moravia and Malaparte the, uh, in the 40s were ostracized as Jewish authors, and they were publishing for 
Curzio Malapartes journal, Prospettive, and many other venues, and, and Curzio Malaparte was one of, one of the most prominent fascist writers and fascist ideologues. Just to represent how complex was the cultural situation of, you know, during the early 40s, but especially uh, in the transition from fascism to democracy, when many stories intertwine in ways that were kind of silenced. So, who are they? I, I just told you. Why Capri? Because Capri was a a, it was not the, the fancy place it is today. It was a place where writers could convene and just have some space to find their own uh, their room. And uh, you know, intellectuals were going to Capri, like uh, <laughs> like in the fifties, were going to Long Island, basically. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Why 1946? Which is interesting because 1946 is an important year during the transition. Important because the enthusiasm, the explosive cultural production of the early post-war period was waning just because politics were changing and they were going along the side of the Cold War. So, all of them were renowned or soon to be famous writers, but of radically different political persuasion. Their opinions diverged, but their books were also at odds with the cultural trends of the period. Their disagreement aptly exemplifies the transition diversified scenario. Their private writings, the, 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 of those hectic months illuminated their contrastive opinions, beginning with how Elsa Morante recorded Mussolini's death in her diary on May 1st, 1945. Morante describes the dictator as the champion of a people with no sense of the common good. And I can read directly from what Mo Morante left in her diary. All these crimes of Mussolini's were tolerated, even encouraged and applauded. Now, a people that tolerates its leaders' crimes becomes an accomplice to these crimes. If it encourages and applauds them, it becomes, worse than an accomplice, an instigator of these crimes. Did the majority of the Italian population realize these acts were crimes? Almost always they realize it. But such is the Italian people that it gives its votes to the strong rather to, than to the just. And if it's made to choose between personal gain and duty, even as it knows what its duty would be, it chooses personal gain. Morante's focus on the ethical accountability of the Italian people for crimes perpetrated by fascism challenges the political narratives of the following years. These narratives, fostered by the new party system that governed the country after the liberation, aimed at legitimizing the birth of the new republic after the ordeal of the war claiming that Italians, especially common people, preserved a moral stability despite 20 years of dictatorship. On the contrary, Morante ascribes the considerable support Mussolini and his regime enjoyed to the individual and collective choices that sustained the dictator and the fascist regime until World War II. Little more than a year later, Morante and her husband Moravia were the guests of Malaparte for dinner at his house in Capri, as I announced earlier. And this is one of the views of this beautiful house. At the time, Malaparte was at the peak of its literary fame. His novel Caput, published in 1944 in Naples while the war was still raging, quickly became a bestseller across Europe. In a letter to his old friend Giuseppe Prezzolini, who back then was the director of the uh, Italian Academy at Columbia University, the author vividly describes the dinner with Morante Moravia. Malaparte wrote indig indignantly of the views of his guests, uh, the views his guests expressed on that occasion. And that's from the letter. At a certain point, I don't know why, it occurred to Moravia to ask me, snickering, if I was sorry Italy had lost the war. Naturally, I immediately responded that not only am I sorry Italy lost the war, but I'm profoundly saddened it didn't win it. Protests from Moravia and his wife who cried, no, it's a good thing that Italy lost the war, it deserved wars, etc., etc. Malaparte concludes the letter with personal remarks on the state of the country after the military defeat. And he writes, I believe, dear Prezzolini, that the only way to react to wretchedness, to defeat, to dishonor, to humiliations, is to feel that one is Italian, to proclaim oneself Italian, etc. His response to Italy's fall was, as he self states in English, my country, right or wrong. The private writings of Morante and Malaparte bear witness to the political and, cult and cultural discontent of these years on how to navigate the post-fascist transition in national history. 
They sample a larger disagreement with the, what I call the narratives of redemption and of national rebirth, that in Italia were called Secondo Risorgimento, a new Risorgimento for the country, that took shape between the demise of Mussolini's regime in the summer 1943 and the Christian Democrats' victory in the 1948 elections. Whether fostered by the resistance myth of a new Risorgimento for the country or sanctioned by Benedetto Croce's authoritative reading of the fascist Ventennio as a parenthesis in Italian history, the idea of a collective redemption prompted interpretation of the recent past not as one as catastrophe, but as a, one of moral re regeneration, of palingenesis. Redenzione, redemption, with its overtly religious undertones and the more secular concept of a moral riscatto, literally ransom, were ubiquitous terms in the 1943-48 political debate, which appropriated and normalized language and slogans of the armed insurrection against fascism and the Nazi invaders. Political redemption and moral regeneration informed collective memory for decades to come, legitimizing in the new party system that granted continuity to the Italian state. The regenerative impact of neorealism, easily the most influential cultural phenomenon of the period, reinforced a collective sense of a new beginning. And I have here a famous uh, you know, frame from the end of uh, Rossellini's Rome Open City, where the new, <laughs> the new generation, the young people, are able to form a community with uh, like the, the looming image of, uh, of the Vatican uh, hovering over them. What is interesting here is that while documenting collective war traumas or the structural injustice of Italian society, cinematic gems such as Rossellini's Open City or Lucchino Visconti's The Earth Trembles paved a clear path to collective rebirth, turning the singular private struggle into a meaningful fragment of a new national epic. The literary counterparts of this movement, momentous film, expressed, as Charles Levitt recently put it, the profound faith in the power of culture to redeem society, a faith that was frequently communicated in Christian terms. Here I have another figure from another film by Rossellini, Paisan, in which again, all the, past, the, the landscape of ruins and, and rubble is illuminated by, by the dome in Florence. My point is that subsequent cultural accounts of the transition prefer to ignore inconvenient experiences, like those typified by Morante and Malaparte, as they complicate the frame of national narratives of redemption. Only in 1999, Jewish journalist Enzo Forcella, who after the 1943 armistice did not join the resistance, wrote how he was unable to assimilate his own experience to what he calls the dialectical template of error, bewilderment, redemption. The error of more or less convinced support for fascism, the bewilderment provoked by the disaster of September 8, and the realization of one's political commitment with the consequent redemption through participation in the resistance. From opposite ideological perspectives, Morante and Malaparte challenged the assumption of Italy's moral regeneration after the break with fascism. That this is another statue, always at the, at the Palazzo degli Uffici in Rome, in which uh, you know a, a clear uh, statue uh, with a Roman salute has been just uh, retouched, and still there to show that things were not really changing. And uh, hmm. so, in the early post-war period. Coming to terms with historical continuity in plan denouncing Italian responsibility in World War II and openly discussing the national defeat as typified by the private writings of Morante and Malaparte and their heated debate in Capri. Both recognitions, however, engender the definitive shipwreck, not the rebirth of the national state born with the Risorgimento. Only an uncompromising appraisal of the shipwreck could lead to a real emancipation from fascism. A stake here was not only Mussolini's Italy, but the romantic idea of the nation that sustained, first of all, the liberal state and its imperialism. As historian Paola Latri would clarify in a, in a 1945 article, fascism in Italy died because it hadn't learned how to keep its promises, not because the promises themselves were revealed to be monstrous.
And you know, I, I'm, I just want to say a couple of more words on how articulated all these uh, problematics in my book, uh, in which I try to point out the books, uh, the, you know, the very successful books that have been kind of erased from cultural memory, and they sold at times even millions of copies, not just in Italy, that really were describing prostration, the trauma war, and that were creating a, an alternative narrative, maybe even with little political um, understanding what was really going on. And, uh, and also, what is important, the journals of the period. <laughs> Something that I try to point out is the role of Rome between 44 and 45. Rome was, you know, open, after being open city, a liberated city, was where all, you know, all intellectual flocked before the North was liberated. And there were something like 20 newspapers in Rome in 1945. Some of them lasted a few weeks. But that kind of cultural explosion is something that has not been studied and not represented because it really, it was a lab, a political laboratory that have, has really few parallels for the rest of uh, modern history, the modern history of, of Italy. So the journals like La Nuova Europa, The New Europe, uh, uh, or Mercurio, that was the first journal, prominent journal where all the writers wanted to write. It was run by Alba de Cespedes, so also an emancipatory in, way, uh, in, in which the, the problem of emancipation of women after fascism was debated among all the, the, the writers. So, this kind of coine, this kind of atmosphere, which was unique, I tried to describe. And also I point out in every, in every chapter to something that I think is worth uh, uh, discussing. First of all, the debate on totalitarianism. Those years uh, had a huge discussion, some books uh, that were badly tolerated at the time, like Carlo Levi's uh, Paura della Libertà, Fear of Freedom, discussed from a sociological perspective, drawing from different traditions, the, the, the Jewish messianism of Central Europe together with uh, so, French sociology, and they tried to describe the problem of, of uh, uh, the scapegoating, which was at the center of a totalitarian regime, finding the enemy a book that was called Barbarian in some of the press of the time. And therefore, I mean, we have Stan Pugliese who had the, you know, uh, work on translating for the first time in English, so then we can discuss about that too. So the debate on totalitarianism that was present in Italy. My second chapter is called The Language of Responsibility, in which I, I, you know, I work with a former fascist writer that fought the, the wrong war and talk, you know, they describe their own test, their own, maybe not testimony, their, their own experience. One among all is uh, Giuseppe Berto, whose novel, The Sky is Red, was saluted by Hemingway as the best Italian writer. And, uh, and, the, and the book was written in, uh, in a concentration camp in Texas because uh, he stayed there for two years as a POW because uh, it was one of the fighters of Alamein, of course, from the wrong side. Uh, one of the great outsiders of, of, of uh, Italian literature, literature of the second, um, of, of the post-war, but also Vitaliano Brancati, other writers that complicated the, the so-called fascist virility and saw how much it was rooted in the culture that was before, in the liberal period, before fascism. The same does also as Samorante in Lies and Sorcery, a novel that has been translated as House of Liars here, read in the 50s, and butchered. The region is like 750 pages. The, the English translation is 500, because all the political parts were cut in the English translation, because it was really problematic. It was problematizing how this uh, transition from fascism to democracy didn't mean real emancipation. And uh, yeah, and so, and also the, another chapter that I call Ghosts from a Recent Past is exactly on these points. The ghost of uh, imperialism, of racism, of uh, uh, everything that happened in Libya, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. There was, you know, there were books like the famous Flaiano's Time to Kill, but stories written by Berto, who was a former fascist, were denouncing the fact that imperialism uh, had strong roots in the Italian society, even beyond fascism. So, this is the book. In, conclu in conclusion, post-Cold War historiography has shown how the transition was marked by the institutional and political continuity between the monarchy that supported fascism and the newborn republic led by the center-right Catholic-oriented coalition. However, private memory and public accounts of the time provide abundant evidence of how these years were characterized by loss, 
trauma, ideological uncertainties after 20 years of pervasive totalitarian pedagogy, the enduring effects of war and of a long dictatorship that set to aggressively modernize the country. In this complex situation, the memory, the memory of the resistance as a secondary surgimento developed also as a result of the political needs of the moment. From contrasting political positions, these authors criticize the preeminence of politics over the lives of individuals. The firm rejection of any political fin fin finalism was for them the starting point for a wealth of compelling inquiries into the debris of pre-war ideas and anxieties of early post-war society. Their works range from Malaparte's critical appraisal of national defeat to Morante's denunciation of how gender biases predated, persisted, and survived the fall of fascism. And yet, there is another conclusion here. And we have to go back to Capri to, to take a look at it. And to that dinner at Casa Malaparte in 1946, to make this final point. In her novel, Lights and Sorcery, that I mentioned before, Morante describes how her female protagonist, in a superb piece of visionary writing, almost Kafkaesque, internalized fascist ideology to the point of desiring to live their lives in a prison. As he repeats in many occasions, Malaparte built his Casa Malaparte with his own memory and trauma of being imprisoned in mind as a, an eccentric intellectual. He spent time in prison, uh, in the fascist prison. And he said in many occasions how he built his house with the prison, uh, you know, the experience of a prison in Regina Celi in mind, from the cretto in the pavement to how, you know, the very severe uh, construction of, uh, of furniture and so on and so forth. So I'm saying that maybe this is one of the secrets of the beautiful Casa Malaparte that enriches the unique Mediterranean, Mediterranean landscape of Italy. Still, this beautiful house sheds light on the difficult heritage of fascism, not only because it replicates a prison in the intention of its builder, but because only through the network of privilege that Malaparte established around his own persona, the construction of this house was possible. I'd like to leave you today with this profound ambivalence, an ambivalence that with Casa Malaparte in Capri is now inscribed in the Italian landscape, with the hope, to, with the hope it will ignite for the discussion. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our hosts, uh, even though Stefano's not here, but in his place, Ruth uh, and the entire staff of the Casa Italiana for always being very gracious hosts. Um, I also make a point now, whenever I speak at these events, to uh, acknowledge the publisher. So uh, congratulations and a thanks to Fordham University Press and Fred Nachbau, whom I've worked with before, for uh, seeing uh, what a rich and fertile uh, work this is that Franco sent in to them. Um, and I just want to make a, a parenthetical remark because of some of those images that Franco had on the screen a few minutes ago. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, just a couple weeks ago, I think it was, that there was a, a survey or an inventory of uh, remaining fascist monuments or plaques or uh, detritus from, uh, <laughs> from the fascist regime. And do you want to take a guess how many items they came up with? Do you remember? Some of you that saw the, this? 40,000. 40,000 remnants of fascist architecture, monuments, paintings, mosaics, etc., etc. So, uh, so we might want to think about that, you know, think about this book in the context of that fact. So, and I, I apologize, I have to look at my notes because uh, there are so many uh, fertile uh, 
vectors from this book that I had to jot them down. And in certain places, I go a little 40, 40 tam, a, a little bit off the path, but uh, maybe it makes sense. So when Fordham University Press first asked me to read Fra Franco's manuscript, I set aside a day to do this, right? Be but because the book is so rich and suggestive, because it has 54 pages of notes, because I kept going back to the writers he mentioned, it took me more than a week. This week, this week when I went back to re-reading it uh, for, this, uh, for this evening, it only confirmed my first impression. Franco has given us a new way of reading these classic texts and a new way of thinking about modern Italian history. He offers a critical and deep reading of some well-known writers such as Carlo Levi, Alberto Moravia, Elsa Moranti, Curzio Malaparte, but also less familiar but unjustly ne neglected writers such as Guido Piovene and Giuseppe Berto, all of whom he mentioned already. His book asks us to revisit, to revision, and to reconsider two liminal moments. One, from uh, Mussolini's removal from office in July of 1943 to the victory of the Christian Democrats in April 1948, and even more so, the precious few months within that period of Ferruccio Pari's government from June to December of 1945. Against Croce, if there ever was a parenthesis in Italian history, these few months of the Pari government were it. In its time frame, Against Redemption overlaps with Rosario Forlanza's recent book, On the Edge of Democracy, Italy, 1943-1948. But whereas Forlanza's book is more strictly political science and polit political theory, Franco's book is more wide-ranging, examining the intersection of writing, history, and political theory. And because of this scope and focus, I think it's one of the most learned, engaging, and provocative works of literary, cultural, and historiographical analysis in years. The period between Mussolini's formal removal from power by the king in July of 1943 and the victory of the Christian Democrats in April of 1948, with the seminal intervening events of the 8th of September when it, the armistice of Italy was announced and Italy switched side to the Allies, Mussolini's execution, execution in April of 1945, and Ferruccio Pari becoming prime minister, and the end of the Pari government in December of 1945, all have long been subject of intense research and debate in post-war Italy. But as Franco demonstrates, the eventual victorious Christian Democrats and the Italian Communist Party both adopted and embraced a teleological narrative of redemption and regeneration as the basis for post-war politics and society. For the communists, it was the imminent revolution. For the Christian Democrats, more temporally ambiguous, but equally certain salvation. Central to both was a premium placed on suffering as a necessary condition to purge the body politic and to make it worthy of a new dispensation. Struggling to carve out a different interpretation were a heterogeneous group of writers and intellectuals who refused to adopt this Christ Christological-centered narrative. So what were the common denominators of these writers? Well, admitting defeat, rejecting the teleological conception of history, rejecting past models of Italian history, and an elegiac phrase in, that Franco writes, embracing a melancholic gaze toward the past. I have written on some of the protagonists in this book and must say that Franco has certainly convinced me to reconsider them in a new light. I learned much from his discussion on Carlo Levi, and his chapter on Malaparte has forced me to reconsider that enigmatic personality in a new way. I had always considered Malaparte, probably some of you the same, as a chameleon at best, a swindler, a cynic, an opportunist. But Franco's judicious and balanced analysis has forced me to reconsider that idea. Malaparte had sincerely embraced the new fascist man, something that Ruth has written about in her first book. Gobetti had called Malaparte fascism's most formidable writer. His two wartime books, Caput and La Pelle, deal with the larger issue of the collapse of European civilization and led inexorably to a tragic conception of history. In the end, I think Malaparte saw himself as too aristocratic, too aloof a figure for either fascism or communism. He was an aristocratic trickster, complicit in the crimes of the regime while claiming otherwise, and making his readers complicit as well. 
Cordo Levi, as everyone knows, is best known for Cristo si è fermato a Eboli, which contains a trenchant critique of this redemptionist narrative of history. But his philosophical meditation, Paura della Libertà, which Franco mentioned, and his L'Orologio uh, are just as important for Franco's thesis. Just a parenthetical note. When Paura della Libertà was first translated into English in 1950 in New York City, it was translated as fear and freedom, not fear of freedom. <laughs> and that, 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 that whole thing convinced me to do another uh, uh, English edition of the book. Similar to Carlo Levi, there was Ignacio Silone, who also found in the civilization of the Contadini of the Mezzogiorno not the promise of redemption, but the more quotidian reality of what might be found in the nearly untranslatable expression Tiro a Campa. From the Cafoni of Abruzzo and the Mezzogiorno, an expression that Silone himself used and not in a derogatory way, the Easter promise of redemption and resurrection never came. For the peasants of Fontamara, it was always Good Friday. This is echoed in Calalevi, where Christ slash history never arrived in Aliano slash Fontamara. Christ and history had stopped at Eboli. This focus or trope of redemption goes a long way in explaining the trajectory of those figures who had no problem in making the transi transition from fascist functionaries to communist intellectuals after or even before 1945. And while I can't think of one off the top of my head, maybe some of you can, I wouldn't be surprised to hear of a figure who made the communist, fascist, communist metamorphosis in those years. Croce's parenthesis theory of fascism would seem to require a need for redemption. Italians had, quote unquote, betrayed history by interrupting the unfolding of liberty. Catholicism, conformism, and the myth of the Italiani brava gente come together in Italy in a poisonous cocktail to prevent a true reckoning with the past. In Germany, there's a rift between those who, like Charles Mayer at Harvard, who write of Germany's unmasterable past, which is the title of one of his books, and those who engage in a coping with the past or coming to terms with the past. Instead, in Italy, we have the Armadio della Vergogna and the Casa Pound. Once Franco points out this theme of redemption, you see it everywhere in Italian history, or at least I started to see it everywhere in Italian history. Not particular or constrained to Catholicism. To be redeemed implies having been in a state of fallenness. The urtext, so to speak, of Italian modern, modern Italian redemption is, of course, the Risorgimento, as Franco mentioned. For modern Italian history, that state of fallenness was the failure to organize into a nation state, supposedly, at least in the Hegelian imagination, the highest order of humanity in history. From Dante to Mazzini, Italy would re be redeemed only after having cast out the foreigners and unified as a nation state. The Risorgimento, when it finally came, came with its own problems, sowing the seeds of fascist Italy uh, and also uh, another necessary redemption. We can now better understand the continuities between liberal and fascist Italy and between fascist Italy and Republican Italy. So, for example, the Italo-Turkish War of 1911 was framed as a redemption narrative, one in which Italy would create its fourth shore and find its own place in the Orientalist sun. World War I was fought and read as completing the Risorgimento, and perhaps also as a redemption for emigration, for the fact that as soon as it was possible and within one generation of unification, millions of Italians left the new nation state. Other attempts at redemption, the war in Abyssinia with Italian priests and bishops blessing departing soldiers at Italian ports, Intervention in the Spanish Civil War with the same priests blessing the same soldiers leaving the same ports. Uh, and the last act in this redemption drama was the anti-fascist, anti-Nazi resistance. Was it a second risorgimento, one that would complete the deficiencies of the first, or was it something entirely sui generis? My own first research in graduate school was on Giustizia e Libertà, the anti-fascist movement created by Carlo Rosselli, Emilio Lussu, Alberto Tacchiani, and others. These would eventually include also Carlo Levi, Leone Ginsburg, and Primo Levi, all anti-redemptionists. 
The failure of Giustizia e Libertà and the Partito d'Azione has usually been traced to their failure in transforming themselves into a mass political party. But in light of Franco's book, we might now see that failure as a function of their refusing to offer redemption to the Italian people, and instead offering them a much more difficult and rigorous political program, one that they decided not to accept. Since reading Franco's book, I have seen redemption narratives everywhere, not just in Italy, and not just in soccer. So, for example, if you follow, allow me this little digression, if you follow Italian soccer, you know that the Neapolitans are already talking about redemption when we win the Scudetto in a few weeks, right? Um, and I have to tell you of, of this uh, episode that I had a few years ago when I was leaving the stadium in Naples and one of those guys that was selling soccer balls and jerseys had a, a flag of the Napoli soccer team and impressed on the flag was the Confederate flag of the United States. And in that was written, the South will rise again. When I went, when I went to have a conversation with this gentleman and tried to explain to him what the Confederate flag meant in the United States, he said, but no, no, you know, the North is against us, and when we win the Scudetto, we will be redeemed, or something to that effect. So, um, yeah, we'll see um, <laughs> in a few weeks. And it's not just Italian history. Vladimir Putin has framed his decades-long neo-imperialist project as a moral crusade for the redemption of greater Russia against the decadent West. Chinese President Xi Jinping and India's Narendra Modi has also used the trope of redemption for their country's history, domestic politics, and foreign policy. And here in the United States, from the city on the hill to the fight over monuments, redemp redemption in a Protestant or even a Puritan key is a red thread through our history and politics. Just a few days ago, the New York Times profiled black South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott as a possible candidate for President of the United States. Quote, he writes, he said, if you want to understand America, you need to start in Charleston, Mr. Scott said. You need to understand and appreciate the devastation brought upon African Americans. But if you stop it at our original sin, I assume he's referring to slavery here, you have not started the story of America because the story of America is not defined by our original sin. The story of America is defined by our redemption. And sure enough, Mr. Scott's book, his campaign book, is titled America, A Redemption Story. Now, I find this very curious because the civil rights movement in America also used the language of redemption, but in a very different way. For Senator Scott, America is already redeemed because we have dealt with our original sin and our sordid past. We have elected a black president and in Scott himself, a black senator. But for the left and the civil rights movement, especially in the wake of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tyree Nichols, and too many others, America is far from redeemed. I sometimes hear in the common refrain, being on the right side of history, the church bells of redemption. But I'm not equating the two. What black Americans were working, when black Americans were working in the civil rights for the, for the redemption, it was not for the redemption of themselves, but for the redemption of white Americans, something that white America did not understand, probably still doesn't understand. So do we have the courage to renounce redemption and therefore paradise? What would a renunciation of redemption actually look like? And Franco tells us in his book. The epigraph for the introduction comes from the journalist Paolo Monelli's memoir of Rome in 1943. Quote, one March day, the following was found on a house in Trastevere. Hang in there, Americans. We're coming to liberate you soon. These battute, these uh, graffiti, were very common during the Second World War uh, in places like Naples and Rome and further north. Uh, this long wait for the supposed liberation from the Allies, they were ironic, even sardonic, but they were not cynical. Franco recounts Elsa Morante's diary entry when she learned of Mussolini's death. Uh, Julian, uh, could we put that quote back on? Otherwise, um, Otherwise, I can read it. I'm going to read it because I want to read it in a different key. I want to, Franco had put this on, but I want to read this in a different key, the key of Trump. 
all these crimes of Mussolini's were tolerated, even encouraged and applauded. Now, a people that tolerates its leader's crimes becomes an accomplice to these crimes. If it encourages and applauds them, it becomes worse than an accomplice and instigator of these crimes. Did the majority of the Italian population realize these acts were crimes? Almost always they realized it, but such is the Italian people that it gives its votes to the strong rather than to the just. And, it's made, and if it's made to choose between personal gain and duty, even as it knows what duty would be, it chooses personal gain. If a few years later, the Harvard sociologist Edward Banfield was to coin the term amoral familism to describe and explain Southern Italy's supposed lack of a civic culture, here Morante was describing an amoral individualism that led to ethical and political disaster, thereby setting the stage or creating the need for redemption narratives. You see this in Italy and in France, where a large percentage of the population collaborated with the occupying Germans, thereby, thereby creating a myth, a necessary myth of the resistance, a necessary collective memory. I'd like to mention some figures who don't appear in Franco's book, didn't take part in this critique of redemption 1945-48. One, because he had been killed by the fascists, and that was Piero Gobetti. It was Gobetti who argued that, quote, fascism is the autobiography of a nation, a nation that rejects the political contest, that worships unanimity, unanimity and shrinks from heresy. End quote. Elsewhere, Gobetti wrote that fascism offers immature Italy a cradle that may be the tomb of civil consciousness, concerned only with civil consciences, concerned only with private affairs. He lamented the lack of a Protestant Reformation in Italy and cites the, the, the loss of the political and intellectual immaturity of the nation. And insightfully points out that the period of greatest heresy, in the best sense of the word, in Italy, was the period of the medieval communes when free and prosperous economic activity was accompanied by corresponding intellectual audacity. So Italy had, all, all along, the tools necessary to avoid the need for redemption. Another figure was Mario Rigoni Stern, a soldier of the Alpini who served on the Russian front, where 26,000 out of 30,000 Italian soldiers perished in the frozen wastelands of Russia. This was the Russian expeditionary force that Mussolini insisted on sending to Italy for the invasion of the Soviet Union. There is a monument in Russia, uh, and it's a, a monument in this kind of mode uh, of the redemptionist uh, ideology, and the, it quotes, to the eternal glory of those who died for the liberation and independence of their country. We're familiar with this kind of lexicon, this vocabulary. Contrast this to Mario Rigoni Stern's novel Il Sergente della Neve, and also his Ritorno Soldan, which was 30 years later. He wrote, uh, Dormite in pace, amici, in, quest in questo silenzio, in questa terra nera, in questo autunno dolcissimo, chino la testa e poi faccio un cenno con la mano. Um, it's not a coincidence that Mario Rigoni Stern was a friend of Primo Levi. If, and I'm going to conclude here, if in 1974 Primo Levi coined the term the, the eternal tendency towards fascism, we can also see similar psychological dynamic in an eternal tendency toward or yearning for redemption. In writing about Primo Levi, I argue that in the wake of the Holocaust, the second fall of man, Levi saw in science and humanism not redemption, but hopefully an answer, perhaps our only answer, to what transpired in the extermination camps of Europe. Franco's book begins with Paolo Monelli's graffiti from the walls of Trastevere in 1943. Hang in there, Americans, we'll, we'll save you soon. And concludes with Mario Soldati's wistful remark, I would like for the Americans to always about to be, uh, always about to arrive and then never ever arrive. In the time and space between those two epigraphs lies in an intellectual and cultural revolution. In the end, the Italians may not be redeemed, but they are granted a, a gift from Clio, a muse of history cited by Alberto Savigno, as Franco mentions, in his new encyclopedia at the conclusion of the book. Clio, the muse of history, reveals the true function of history, which is to gradually close our actions in the past 
with the purpose of lifting their weight from our sh shoulders and making us rediscover every morning a new spirit in the absence of a new world. This is the gift of a possibility, an opportunity to create ourselves without recourse to redemption. Thank you. Um, so my mic's on, right? Yeah, it's all good? Okay. So a century after the march on Rome, we have a far-right prime minister in Italy, Giorgio Meloni's party, Brothers of Italy. It's a neo-fascist party. It was founded in 2012 because at the time, the neo-fascists had no autonomous political representation. It uses the fascist slogan, God, Fatherland, and Family. And the flame in the logo is the flame of the original neo-fascist party founded after World War II. And she personally insisted on that flame being kept in the logo. Other people uh, wanted to get rid of it. Uh, other ministers in the new government also come from a past of neo-fascist militancy, and they believe that non-white and non-Christian groups living in Italy threaten the integrity of Italian values. Now, Maloney calls herself a conservative, but her positions on population and the family are extreme. She's against, quote, gender ideology, quote, L LBGTQ lobbies, and anything that harms the natural family. Um, her version of great replacement theory, which she calls uh, la sostituzione etnica, ethnic substitution, goes deep into conspiracy theory territory. It's like to the right of Tucker Carlson. It, it's incredible. Um, I think, this is a quote from her, I think there's a deliberate plan to erase everything that identifies us, culture, nation, family. They're all under attack. She stated in March 2019. And who's responsible for this? George Soros, of course, and the Democratic European Union. And these are the masterminds. Also in the government is Matteo Salvini as Minister of Infrastructure and Transport, who called for a, quote, mass cleansing, street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, of immigrants the last time he was in the government. And now he controls the Coast Guard. Um, and you're getting the, you get the, the picture. <laughs> so I'm starting with this information about Italy's current political reality because the advent of a far-right government is prompting new interest, not only in the history of Italian fascism, but also in the conditions and circumstances that led to Italy having a very different exit from fascism than Germany did. And when I do public events and television, et cetera, one of the questions I'm most asked uh, is, uh, why did Italy have a legal neo-fascist party all these years? Why was there no real equivalent to denazification? Why were there no war crimes <laughs> trials for atrocities committed either in Europe, in the Balkans, for example, or in the colonies? The decisions that were made by Allied and Italian governments in the immediate post-war years have had a long and fateful afterlife. And so it's very interesting, Stan mentioned the um, survey that was done and that resulted in us knowing there are 14,000 uh, remnants and artifacts. And when in 2017 um, I published this piece for The New Yorker, uh, and the editor entitled it, Why Are, um, what was it called? Why Are So Many Fascist Monuments Still Standing? And it was greeted in Italy with like a mass psychosis. Uh, it, I got death threats at the Casa on the phone. I mean, it was unbelievable. It touched a nerve. Um, and, and it, but knowing now that there are 14,000, <laughs> 40? 40, 40? Oh, I'm sorry, 40,000, okay. So, Anyway, that's a whole other subject, but it's related. Um, and the point is that not only are, are, is having, you know, right now, today, is like the fascists beating up anti-fascists in the streets in Italy. The question, not only of fascism, but how, how the post-war order was created that allowed the memory of fascism to disappear or to be obscured in a way that it wasn't in Germany. 
So all of this makes Franco's book so timely. He tells the story of a reckoning among intellectuals in the mid and late 1940s with, with the moral and other legacies of the dictatorship. And I have to say, as his former advisor, from his graduate student years, Franco always stood out for being an independent thinker and had a very strong sense of what questions should be asked that were not being asked at the time, and also what research needed to be done. But it wasn't just like there's a gap in the literature. It was like more of a, also a moral political imperative. Um, very, very, very directed and very strong, unusually so in a, in a grad student. So in this book, one of the very um, original things he does is he takes intellectuals who, who are, you know, very known, um, Moravia, you know, Levy, et cetera, but he looks at them alongside intele intellectuals who were you know, also known within Italy, for, but for different things, like Umberto Saba. So we don't just look at his poetry, we look at his other kinds of uh, discourses he was making. And individuals who were big in the debates of those times, but have been kind of forgotten, Fabio Cusino or Guido Piovene, um, or who were deemed too difficult to talk about, so they just kind of got swept away um, under the carpet, so to speak. So. Franco reconstructs this fluid moment before the orthodoxies of you know, Christian democracy and communism were solidified. And that's, that's something, it's not, that, it's not easy to do, and that's one of the big merits of the book. Um, and he also reconstructs the dialogues and debates around these figures regarding uh, responsibility for violence, the meaning of ethical action, and the failings of the Italian national character. And most of his protagonists moved between literature and reportage, and so he also you know, raises the question of the meaning of literature, and more broadly, you know, culture at this time of transition. Um, and it wasn't just the impegno sociale, of the communists, it's also about this, uh, these redemption narratives, whether they're communist, whether they're Catholic, or there's some other thing, um, laishi, in, in the sense of not being you know, secular. They're not espoused to the religion of communism or the religion of Catholicism and Christian democracy. So, so that's, that's um, interesting. So my first um, question for you, so, and Stan has partly explained this, but I'd like to hear in your words, the title of your book is Against Redemption. And so I'd like to know why that title, why be against redemption, we've partly heard, but what were the, op what were the other options? If you don't have redemption, how, do you, how and where, where are you dwelling and how? How are you creating a sense of your life um, as an Italian coming out of the war and the dictatorship if you get take away redemption. Um, so, and of course, you know, there, and Stan mentioned the narratives of the Italiani you know, buona gente, that Italians were good people, all the attempts to wash the sins away and rehabilitate Italy internationally, and then the tendency to judge um, everybody based on what they did between 1943 and 45. And, if you're unfamiliar with this, there were people who were like super fascists for, they were squadrists, they were, you know, killing people and all over the place. And then they went into the resistance. And so all was forgiven and all was forgotten. So that was, and there were, there were reasons to privilege that, but um, it meant that the t 20 years, cause Italy, you know, Mussolini was there like for over 20 years that was all kind of washed away um, in some cases. So, um, so that's how you get this, there's the theme in Italian history, the continuity of the state, where the bureaucracies, the mentalities, the mindsets kind of just keep going from fascism to the republic, um, and we don't want to question things. So the book is also giving us um, a framework to think about that. Um, and my favorite example, uh, I should have sent Julian the, the, the um, photos, 
there was a journal of, I don't remember the title, there's a journal of linguistics, and, it, and during the fascist period, it was, let's just say it was called like La Revista de Linguistica, and it had a nice cover with a design, and it had fasci, and when, and after 1945, they just kept everything and they took the fasci away. <laughs> but they had the same edi editors, the same, it was all the same. Um, and this journal had been like very big into the, there was a whole like linguistic autarky uh, campaign. It was like a whole language policy. So they were not just, um, uh, they were not just a disinterested linguistic journal, they were really in the battaglia, you know. And then they, all they did was take the fasci away and they thought, okay, we're just gonna continue on. So it's a cosmetic, it's a cosmetic passage out of fascism. So the book, the book um, complicates that because it, it, it gets, it treats people who had a very complex um, wrestling, reckoning with these issues that later became inconvenient to think about up to today, right? Um, so it's very, very important to go back to that complexity um, now that we have somebody who said, well, you know, I'm a conservative and in fact was like a hardcore neo-fascist militant, this is Meloni, and everybody like watching themselves through Berlusconi. So it's really important to go back to this. Um, so I think that was, those are my questions for you. Um, so, so Franco will respond and then we'll take some questions from you. Well, thank you so much for such a difficult question, Ruth. Uh, so, <laughs> against redemption, what were the other options? Uh, it's not easy, <laughs> but I try to respond because the, uh, both Stan and Ruth uh, provided such a, a, a broad scenario of what my book tried to be and also how, in a certain way, it resonates with contemporary politics. Uh, of course, this is a book that is, uh, that is you know, it concentrates on a, of a very tiny uh, slice of, uh, of uh, I would say European history, not just Italian history, because most of the writers and the authors I'm talking about really contributed to debates that they were, they were global at that time. As I said before, people like Hemingway were very alert of these books that and sometimes were just kind of disappear from, from view, even within Italy. And uh, there is something to say about this. Um, what, were the, what were the other options? First of all, the idea of uh, redemption was so ubiquitous in that moment from every possible political standpoint, from the far right to the far left. The far right was exactly saying the real redemption was our redemption because we were been talking about redemption through the fascist state, which was not a personal redemption, it was like a, a sort of a, a nullifying, annihilating the individual in the nation, in the state. So your body doesn't count, the body politic does. So this discourse was so ingrained, there were 20 years of hammering a discourse like that in the, in, the, in the textbooks, in the cultural production, in the frescoes of the universities that I tried to that I show earlier, that this discourse of redemption that clearly has uh, some strong roots uh, in the in the Catholic discourse, was ubiquitous, was everywhere. And I, you know, even the Communist Party, in order to make it his own new verb, in his, new, his own new ideas, understood on a popular level, that was the way to gain traction. Uh, as I was mentioned before, the, the, the war of conquest of Libya was described by literati as the redemption of our nation. And also, something that uh, I'm influenced by, by, by Sarah, my wife, who works at the Met, and about like, the cultural artifacts, how, um, how now looted artifacts are difficult to, to describe, because, uh, and, and also to what to do with these, all these cultural artifacts in museums in the United States, in Italy, and uh, you know, repatriate them is a first step of a longer process. It's not 
Did you redeem yourself just by bringing back the, the Aksum obelisk that represented the conquest of Ethiopia for 60 years in front of a, um, an, an international building, uh, the FAO, you know, the, the fund for, uh, for, uh, <clears throat> for food that was this in Rome. In front of it, there was uh, the obelisk of, of Aksum that only recently, in 2005, was, uh, was given back to, to Ethiopia. Just to get you know, like one story of all these uh, cultural artifacts that are part of this story. I, I show you some images because the, the artistic, architect, architectural, urbanistic side is the other face of what the, the writers wrote in that time. Uh, something that I think is very important is to know that, that all these uh, writers were, were, were really aware of the problems that uh, buildings, monuments, uh, representation were for the future, for the pedagogy of democratic values. And a discussion that was there, that is also you know, kind of partial in the book, it might be my next project, by the way, uh, would be very interesting to, to, um, to outline. So the idea of redemption, uh, the going against redemption, was, a, first of all, a disruptive discourse. A discourse that, was, a discourse that was saying, we don't have to use anymore the words of the past, because the words of the past led to imperialism, total war, and destruction. As a matter of fact, as a, some of the journalists that I mentioned, like for, for Cella, but also Alatri, they were also prominent intellectuals. They were publishing for journals like La Nuova Europa. If you read La Nuova Europa, and for me it was a, even fun to do research in this, in this journal, there were there are very little uh, critical literature about. But there are all the best writers in Europe that were writing for that. But they were not aligned, for instance, either neither with the Catholic Party nor with the Communist Party. So La Nuova Europa, the new Europe, was already foreseeing uh, you know, a new federation going beyond the idea of nation state, 1944, 1945. The war was not even over. So the freshness that was there, and there were writers were writing aphorisms, were writing uh, essays, they were f f lyrical, uh, they were trying to create a new culture, a new culture that was really getting rid of the historicism that created fascism and all the kind of mentality that was just looking backwards at the ruins of what was the greatness of uh, not just Italy but the Western civilization to propose new colonialism, new imperialism, new state of power in which the state or the, 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 the past would represent a legitimization of the power. Before I mentioned the, the um, you know, the, the work the, 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 with, the, with the looted artifacts. But for instance, there's new research right now that is phenomenal, seeing how this war in Libya in 1911, 1912, provoked a, a wave of uh, reproductions of uh, the images of, uh, of the Mediterranean from the point of view of ruins, from the point of view of uh, the Roman ruins. I am, recently I've been also looking at maps of the 30s and, and early 40s where the, they were trying to reproduce uh, uh, the Mediterranean as a, as a landscape of ruins because that mean, meant we have to go back and redeem the land. Redeem the land means like getting rid of all the artifacts, the buildings that were uh, Byzantine, Arab, uh, you know, Ottomans, so on and so forth, and just, just isolate the Roman past. This is a strategy that goes again parallel to what was uh, fascism, but that is true, so way before that. We have to redeem the land by pointing out what was already ours. And of course, this is like a reactionary strategy. Uh, the writers that I'm mentioning here understood that this discursive practice was uh, rot, was corrupted from within. And probably some of them don't have an answer to what to do next. But the point is to point, you know, to highlight the shipwreck, how this idea of the nation couldn't have a future if you want really want to have an inclusive, inclusive society. And it was already in the debates after Second World War. Something that I, I'd like to point out again, uh, regarding redemption is just that the reviews that I found in this, uh, in, in this journal, in, in, the, in this period, because uh, especially in Rome, but not only in Rome, again, there was this explosion, a cultural explosion. When there is a void of power, very often there is a cultural explosion, because finally people can say what they haven't said for 20 years. And, uh, that, what I found was phenomenal, in my opinion, and I tried to, to, you know, to report it in the book, that very often the reviews of the books that I work here were incredibly racist. Why? Because they were often, but also they gave me like, the, the, like a sort of a 
direction or where to go for further research. I'm just quoting one, uh, the book by Carlo Levi. Carlo Levi was a, a Jewish Italian intellectual and uh, was, uh, mm, <clears throat> he was he's famous for uh, his book, uh, Christ Stopped the Eboli, which is also a political manifesto, not just uh, like a, a southern question, not just like uh, uh, going back to the, to the roots of Italy and so on and so forth, see a different Italy. It's a political manifesto claiming for autonomy. Autonomy is going to be, uh, in the 60s and 70s, a big catchphrase for a different kind of left. And it has already its roots in what Leone Ginsburg in the 30s, together with Carlo Levi, was elaborating. Uh, so, you see there is like a, the, the, these books and these ideas were like some sort of subterranean uh, within Italian culture, within European culture. It's not that they were just like uh, in that moment then they disappeared. So what I want to say is that, for instance, I found some reviews of uh, uh, Fear of Freedom, this amazing sketch of a totalitarian theory, unparalleled in Italy at that time, and a difficult book, very difficult book, but very interesting. And that, I mean, Giancarlo Vigorelli, great, uh, great literary critic, sophisticated literary critic, coming from a right-wing background, like Malaparte, friend of Malaparte, friend of Rizzolini. The point is that all these fascist intellectuals, they were not just like uh, dull uh, figures. They were extremely knowledgeable what was going on all around Europe, much more than sometimes their counterparts. And... Uh, Malaparte was a, you know, a star in French culture in, in, in Paris in the 30s. Vigorelli and Piovene, for instance, Piovene would be called later on Il Conte Rosso, the Red Count, because it was a noble, or, noble origin, but he was writing uh, the most anti-Semitic, uh, anti but also anti-queer um, people writings that are possible, but you know, this is in the 30s and 40s. Just to go back to a completely different scene, he became the, the Conte Rosso, the Red Count, and in, in after, commun um, after 45. So, Sorry, I want to make sure we have time. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just get to, to my point uh, to the, um, of, of the Vigorelli review, and, and, I, and I'm sorry for if it takes, uh, takes long. Uh, the point is that, for instance, uh, Vigorelli reviewing this journal was pointing out the fact that uh, if you, in order to understand these books, uh, you have to have in mind uh, the Martin Buber and the great literature uh, and all the, the Jewish literature of Europe, but in a dismissive way. He was writing something that is not even Italian. And in fact, by looking at these traces, uh, you can recuperate the broad scene, the broad uh, uh, scenario that was behind all these authors. Thank you. <laughs> so do we, we have questions? I know people had, uh, there were people who told me they were having, they wanted to have a question for Franco, so yes. Well, definitely Elsa Morante's words resonate. Definitely your title against um, redemption resonates. Um, especially that uh, the issue is how do you define redemption when it's undefinable more and more nowadays, when we are in the hands of conspiracy theories, when we do not even know what reality is, uh, should be based on facts, on, uh, uh, on real things that happen, instead we are in the hands of conspiracy theories. And like you say, it, uh, redemption is relative. It depends on who you know, describes it in their own ways. So what is redemption? How do we obtain this so-called redemption? Is it possible to have a redemption? When maybe, according to Elsa Morante, and I agree with her, maybe it's part of our human impulses to go against freedom, to go against what's right, as we are noticing in the American uh, political reality and maybe also in the European uh, reality. We are totally going against redemption. We're going again toward the totalitarianism and the fascism. Yeah, briefly. I, I, I totally see your point. Uh, the pro the, what these writers that I, uh, that I discuss in this book are trying to point out, though, is that uh, yes, 
more than defining what is redemption, is just uh, create criticism and just see how these catchphrases are very often uh, of the point. So, as Rante pointing out the responsibility and accountability of Italian people uh, for the crimes of the fascist regime was uh, really against what was a big narrative of uh, the Italian people are intrinsically good. In fact, they never really believe in fascism. I think this is already a great move towards uh, a different, you know, a different conception. Other questions? Um, was there redemption before Christ? <laughs> I mean, my point being, my point being that it seems like it might be a very Catholic Italian or Catholic other country thing. I mean, it wasn't, I don't think it's in Judaism. I'm not a scholar, but I don't know. But I don't think it's in Judaism. I don't know if it was in any of the, um, the religions or the culturals of, for instance, the Etruscans or any of the people that came before that. So is, it, is redemption a Catholic thing, I guess? Uh, even here, there's, a, there's a many ways of uh, answering this question. But the concept of tikkun that is central for Jewish tradition, it means redemption and restoration. And it is uh, debated uh, by, by, by Martin Buber, among others, because that was another kind of idea. And Carlo Levi writes a lot about it, knowing that the people that are around him will just accuse him of being bar barbaric. But drawing from you know, Gershon Scholem, <laughs> tradition that are intrinsic to uh, the German Jewish Koine in Europe. You know what's so ironic, though, is that because people, you know, with, between the, the Croce, the parenthesis, and all the other kind of whitewashing that was going on uh, and was allowed to go on by, you know, the Allies decided to have a policy that was going to be very different than Germany, where Italians were good people who had been led astray by a bad man, and that bad man was conveniently dead. Um, but the irony then is that the things, there's all this discussion about redemption, but the actions and the things that were done for like over 20 years that would require the redemption weren't being talked about. So the, re, the discourse of redemption can, this is why your book's so important, because it can be a bit abstract, because so there's this almost like also self-flagellation, but nobody's talking about what actually happened in the past, and it's uncomfortable to talk about it. So it's a really, it's a really complex and a weird transitional space, and uh, it's rare to have a book that really does it justice. Um, and there's something surreal about it, too, in times. And that's one of the great merits of your book. Do you want to speak I was going to ask you, uh, by the time that uh, the dialogue of Morante, Moravia, Malaparte takes place, you said 48, right? No, so, uh, 46, the 46. dialogue takes place, but they, you know, they continue for yeah. the So Togliatti years. had already been there in visit in Capri a couple of years before from Soviet Union. I was wondering. Uh, First of all, is it true or is it just a, a apocryphal story that uh, the Villa Come Me is called like that also because it was shaped like a stylized hammer with a sickle on top? <laughs> uh, but in, in any case, had, uh, my, 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 my main question is, had the conversion of Malaparte to or, or his uh, uh, getting closer to the Communist Party already happened uh, or was, was already in, in the making? And if so, how could he justify his uh, take on you know, this very nationalistic uh, uh, and uh, undefeated, uh, you know, uh, I wish Italy had won the war. Yeah. OK, well, this is a, a very, very interesting question about this character that is a, a one of the main protagonists of, the, of, of my book, Curcio Malaparte. Uh, his Casa in Capri is famous worldwide. His books were famous worldwide, are now retranslated even by New York Review Books classics because they are seminal to understand that specific period. Uh, interestingly enough, 
Toyati comes back from Russia, he lands in, uh, in Naples or Sorrento now, I don't remember, and one of the first people that he wants to meet is exactly Curzio Malaparte because he knows he's the best journalist of Italy. And in 1941, for the Corriere della Sera, he wrote some articles that were read by everyone because he was, he was discussing how uh, the, the, the Red Army, it was like a, um, you know, a war correspondent from the Balkans and then Ukraine, and he was discussing how the clash between the Russian and the Nazi army, of course the Russia are, were about to lose, that's what he writes in his articles, but then in the meantime he was describing the Russians as, hum, as human people, as a, uh, you know, well organized, as a people that as the, 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 you know, the army of the Russians at the center and the, of, the, of their construction of society, and how in the same time uh, the um, they were able to create in 20 years a new tough race. For an attentive reader in 1941, understanding this was also a parody of what was fascism because it uses exactly the same phrases that were hammered by uh, Mussolini every day in a moment when Mussolini's army was collapsing in Russia, was collapsing in, uh, in Northern Africa and so on and so forth. Therefore, Toyati understood all too clearly that it could be a phenomenon uh, weapon in his own army. He writes, for, uh, he writes for articles for the Unita, the communist uh, newspaper, uh, about the liberation of Florence, and then provoked an uproar among communist intellectuals because they were like, everyone, but not Malaparte, not on our side, because uh, he, he, he was probably not a good comrade from that perspective. <laughs> Funny enough, the last interview Malaparte is to Mao Zedong, just before dying. And uh, in his, uh, in his, um, you know, in his uh, will, he is giving Casa Malaparte, that we saw, to the uh, Chinese Republic to host uh, every year Chinese artists to, you know, to, to thrive uh, in a different context. And of course, the family Malaparte, for 30 years, they try in every possible way to, to stop that because, that, no, no, this is our casa, this is not for Chinese people. But that shows how complex was that period and how the, the ideological fluidity we discussed before. So we have time for one more question. Um. Um, just going back to that quote about the, um, you know, the Italian people needing to, you know, their support for the regime of Mussolini during that period and that, you know, whether they, whether that would include people who were not fascist supporters, right? In other words, like, if you look at today's world, it's easy to sort of say, oh, the, the supporters of Maloney or the, you know, whoever it is in the US, you know, who's got an interest in that kind of thing, and everyone's like, oh, it's clear that those people cannot be redeemed and we should not redeem them, et cetera. But if you're looking backward and saying, well, this bad thing happened, 20 years of totalitarian fascism, now it's over, we wanna move on, so we're gonna have this redemption narrative that's put forth culturally and politically, do you think they include these people who don't want to allow that or want to critique that, including yourself, I imagine, would you include the people who were not overt supporters just as members of society, as those who bore some responsibility for those crimes? Do you see what I mean? I think I, I did. Let me see if I really understand the, the, the question. The, the point is that when I'm saying against redemption, I'm not saying, I mean, it was, a, of course, a catchphrase of the political discourse at the, that time. There is no, I don't have a moral judgment on people using it. I, it's not like, a, oh, it's just bad to use this idea. Because, for instance, for the Italian resistance, that prompted the intention of a, a lot of uh, young women and young men to get rid of the fascist and the Nazi, and that worked very well. The point is that the intellectual, the writers uh, that I try to reference in, in my book, try to go and take another step, meaning, okay, now they've been using these slogans, can we get rid of the discourse uh, uh, of crimes that, that is imbued in the idea of redemption? Because for the sake of redemption, we, we in the past committed crimes. And I think the whole this discussion of, uh, of uh, the new parties embracing this idea, both the communist and the, the Catholic, is very meaningful of how um, there was not a real, a real sense, a real will to you know, 
not just to, 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 to start a trial of the criminal, but also to really face, uh, tackle these, these, these problems. Yeah, because it was Togliatti who granted an amnesty, right? There was the national reconciliation. So, Stan, do you want to say anything before we close? Um, I would say, like, there's the problem of this uh, business of redemption because it's so, like, wrapped up with Catholicism. It's so hard to get out of that, right? For Kolelevi, he, I guess he imagined that the peasants that he encountered in, pl in a place like Aliano, you know, were beyond redemption because they had been they had never even been imbued with this kind of Catholic mentality, you know? Um, and then the, the other question is like, you know, if there's not redemption, what is it? Well, I, I, you could say there's redemption and redemption. If there's redemption with a kind of reckoning uh, with the past, which is another theme that's been uh, with us tonight, uh, I don't think, you know, Italy had that. And by the way, the contrast is usually with you know Germany that oh look Germany you know they mastered the past they they have a record well if you just see what's going on with the German police and the German military I'm not so sure that they have a, a you know they merit that reputation you know um, Carlo Carlo Rosselli at one point wrote this essay uh, I miei conti con il marxismo my reckoning with Marxism you know there are certain Italian intellectuals that are in this constant uh, it's self-engagement, self-critique, you know, uh, a kind of reckoning either be, whether it be with fascism or communism or whatever. But in Italy it seems that, to me at least, many Italian intellectuals take the easy way out. On that note, um, <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Pugliese, and applause for uh, the wonderful book and author, Franco. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming tonight.